The execution of the rebel leaders in 1916 changed everything. It transformed what had been a disastrous rebellion on the streets of Dublin into something magnificent, glorious. It changed the mood of the Irish people who had booed and jeered the rebels as they were being led away and now mourned them. It became the pivotal moment in the creation of the modern Irish state. And what's interesting is that the British government almost avoided this. They almost realised what was happening. The chief secretary, the chief officer on the part of the British government in Ireland at that time was Augustin Burl. And Burl spotted what was happening. He warned the British Prime Minister Asquith just after the rebellion was crushed, saying, it is not an Irish rebellion. And it would be a pity if ex post facto it became one and was added to the long and melancholy list of Irish rebellions. 30 years later, in retirement in England, he reflected on those words. And he said that, as a rebellion, it was a ridiculous failure from the first. But as an event in Irish history, it was horrible and heartbreaking. And being accompanied by house to house fighting, sniping and murdering, it stains the memory. It was a supreme act of criminal folly on the part of those who were responsible for it. For it never had a chance and was really nothing more than a Dublin row. Burl himself would see his career destroyed by the rebellion. He would write in 1916 that personally he felt smashed to pieces. The problem is that even though Burl didn't want to write the names of these leaders in the annals of Irish history alongside Wolftone and Robert Emmett, he ended up doing just that. He believed that they had to make an example of these leaders. He wrote at the time saying that the leaders both fighting leaders and stump orators are criminals and short shrift should be given. In other words, an example would have to be made. And his folly, the folly of General Maxwell, who was the commander of the forces, in executing 16 men, in taking them out and shooting them, in murdering them uh, in that way, well, that kick-started the beginnings then of Irish independence. The key foundation document in this period was the proclamation of the provisional government, which Patrick Pearce, the chosen leader of this insurrection, composed and read out outside the GPO, the General Post Office, the scene of the base of operations for the rebels. Pearce was a fantastic orator, a charismatic personality, a magnetic personality who drew people into him. But on the day of Easter Monday, the 24th of April, 1916, his magnetism deserted him. The crowds gathered around, did not really know what he was doing or what he was reading. Some women went into the post office to collect their pensions and were surprised when they were told that the post office had shut down because it had been taken over for a rebellion. People were confused. And yet that document, which was produced the night before, which was a messy construction because they ran out of different letters, different fonts, and had to mix all of these fonts to get a finished typescript. That letter, that document, that proclamation became the founding document of the Irish state. In fact, it is the document that is our Declaration of Independence and it still inspires Irish people today. And I'm going to read it because it's only 487 words long. And I'm going to read it because it provides a good history of Ireland and a good account of what exactly not only the rebel leaders of 1916 were trying to achieve, but previous generations of Irish rebels and martyrs. I mentioned that 2,500 copies uh, were produced. It's interesting that only a handful now, now survive. And at auction, whenever a new, new, new version is found and sold, 
It is sold for an incredible amount of money. Why did so few survive? Because the British went to great pains afterwards to destroy all of these proclamations, to suppress these words. An oration which, although was not particularly impressive when delivered by Pierce outside the GPO, has resonated for generations. The only line of Irish in it is the title, Publacht na Heron, the Republic of Ireland. And it begins, the provisional government of the Irish Republic to the Irish people. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations, from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for freedom. Now, what's really interesting about that? Irish men and Irish women. And Irish women would fight alongside Pierce and the other revolutionaries in the GPO and during Easter week and in the struggle ahead. This was a time when women did not have the right to vote, when women were seen as second-class citizens, but not for Pierce and James Connolly, the socialist leader who was another inspiration. They wanted rights for all Irish people, men and women. The Dead Generations was an invocation of the heroes of Ireland's past. It summoned her children, children meaning not young people, but it's eg her exile children, her people not only in Ireland but around the world, the diaspora that had been forced to flee Ireland during the famine and in the years afterwards. The second part continued. Having organised and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organisation, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organisations, the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, she now seizes that moment and, supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe, but relying in the first on her own strength, she strikes in full confidence of victory. A lot of interesting lines there, supported by her exiled children in America. America, which had done so much to support the Irish revolutionaries, the Fenians in the 19th century, sending money, sending weapons, sending support. America was seen as the land which would, as it grew in influence and power, become a country that could be Ireland's greatest weapon in the fight against British rule. But the next line was certainly more controversial, supported by gallant allies in Europe. Who were these gallant allies? It was Imperial Germany, who Britain was engaged in a dramatic world war against, who America would end up joining that war on the side of Britain uh, in 1917, just a year later. The, the reference to gallant allies elevated this rebellion to a higher level in the minds of the British. It wasn't just troublesome, quarrelsome Irish people rising up as they seem to do every 30 years or so. It was Irish people siding with Germany against them. It was traitorous, treacherous Irish showing that they couldn't be trusted. And that was why they felt afterwards the leaders would have to be executed. The line ending, we strike in full confidence of victory, was a fantasy. They knew setting out on Easter Monday that there was no chance of success. It was only a question of how long they could hold out. In part three, they set out their vision for the kind of Ireland they wanted. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it ever be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the past 300 years they have asserted it in arms. Standing on that fundamental right and again asserting it in arms in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign independent state 
and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare and its exaltation among the nations. And so many parts of that were crucial for the Irish people, the ownership of land. And land had been such a grievance for the Irish going back to the plantations in the 17th century. Throughout the famine, ruthless exploitative landlords had evicted their tenants because they could not pay their rents, leaving them on the side of the road to starve and die. There had been vicious land wars in the 1870s and the 1880s. This section determined that the Irish nation was sovereign. It would control its own destiny. There is the reference to the six rebellions. The rebellions which had inspired these revolutionaries, 1641, 1690, 91, 1791, 1803, 1848 and 1867. 1916 was to join that pantheon, that list, and we'll be looking at all of those rebellions in this course. It goes on then, to, it returns then to the use of we, making it a more personal document in section four. The Irish Republic is entitled to, and hereby claims, the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally, and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which have divided a minority from the majority in the past. That section is the most quoted and misquoted part of the entire proclamation. Just Google the phrase, cherishing all the children of the nation equally, and you will see pages of Irish politicians, Irish men and women who have quoted and misquoted those lines throughout the last 100 years. It has come to mean cherishing children. It has come to mean that whenever we look at how infants are treated, our educational system from school leavers, uh, uh, the treatment of anyone under the age of 18, if it doesn't reach us, it is, we have failed to live up to the ideals of the proclamation. But look at it in its context. It is clearly a reference not to young adults, young people, babies and infants. It is a reference to all Irish people, those North and those South, those Catholic and those Protestant. It is saying that it respects all Irish people, no matter what their religion, no matter what their allegiance. It is hoping to unite them all, as Wolf Tone had, substituting the religious divisions of Catholic, Protestant and dissenter for the common name of Irishman. It is a bold claim. It claims the allegiance of every Irish man and every Irish woman. And it shows the views of the Irish revolutionaries then and immediately afterwards in believing that although there was a large unionist community in Ireland which wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, the revolutionaries believed that this was not a natural state of affairs, that they had been corrupted by the English-British influence and once you expel this alien government from Ireland, the unionists and the nationalists would join together. That was a fantasy, that was a myth. That was to be responsible for so much violence in Ireland in the years ahead. But it was a myth that they had to believe in. It was a myth they had to buy in, because otherwise they would have to have acknowledged, even to themselves, that Ireland was a divided country. The final part begins, until our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of, of a permanent national government, representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected by the suffrages of all her men and women. The provisional government hereby constituted will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic in trust for the people. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessings we invoke upon our arms. And we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonour it by cowardice, inhumanity or rapine. In the supreme hour, the Irish nation must, by its valour and discipline, and by the readiness of its children, 
to sacrifice themselves for the common good prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called. And again, see that reference to children, the children of Ireland, the people of Ireland joining together to fulfill their august destiny. It is the declaration of Irish independence, a combination of fact and fiction, of history and mythology, of aims and aspirations and ideals, of their hopes and dreams as they went out to fight a rebellion which they knew would end in their deaths. It portrayed an Ireland which never existed, but it portrayed an Ireland which was the Ireland of their dreams.